Hey, hello, 10.2. Um, of course, 10.1, you're welcome to watch this video as well if it helps you. I'm, we're going to talk mostly about the, the gravitation part of the lesson that 10.2 didn't get last class, that is short block. Uh, but also going to go over the lab. So um, putting this help stuff in the lab, this is also a good place to look for that. Um, so obviously I'm home sick with a throat infection. I haven't, haven't spoken since, like, Friday. Um, and hoping I can get through, like, a 15-minute screencast for you without too much um, croaky voice and just, like, discomfort. So anyway, hopefully this is helpful for you guys. So here's the calorie preload. Um, we haven't had time to do it yet because you've ha I've had your notebooks for assessment. Hopefully you get them back today because I obviously was so sick this weekend I couldn't grade them, but I will grade the digital versions you guys uploaded. Um, and these terms are, there's not a ton of vocabulary in this unit, especially compared with biology, but the terms are tricky because you need to be careful that you don't mix them up with where we talk about these things like energy and weight in everyday life. So make sure you have these terms for that. I'm going to, I posted on Schoology and I will share in the slides the video as well about um, the physics definitions and make sure you have those clear in your mind as we continue this unit. They'll get more as you build more complicated concepts in this unit, it's more and more important that you have these key terms really clear for you. So this is our little mini lesson on gravitation that leads into the lab that we're doing today. Um, so take a minute and copy on the template if you need to, and please pause there to do so. If you want to have an extra page for um, your investigation, if you want to have like a one page for notes, one page for the investigation, and another page for the you're welcome to do so. If you, need, uh, if you need a data table space or more procedure writing space, go ahead and take that. Okay, so pause the video, copy the template. Okay, so what is gravitation? So there are four fundamental forces in the universe. We spoke about these in grade nine in your forces and fields unit, which was our first physics unit. We did it in about November last year, and um, we're gonna build on that in this unit. So if you don't remember much about that unit, uh, I would go back to your notebook from last year and take a look. And gravitation is what we'll be starting with in this unit, and it is the weakest of those four forces. But due to gravitation, it can work over infinite distance, which is how a lot of things in our universe function is based on this principle. For example, the fact that we have all of our planets orbiting the sun is due to the sun's gravitational field, which is really, really far away in the case of things like Neptune and Pluto and other um, transiting objects like the Oort cloud, those are able to uh, orbit around the sun because of the sun's mass and its gravitational field being able to work over such a long, long distance. The symbol we use for gravitation for the force of gravity is capital F for force. We always use capital F for any force and the subscript is G for gravitation. It's a capital G for the force of gravitation. And the first kind of topic in this unit is gravitation, and then we're going to go and talk about different kinds of examples, talk about momentum and impulse and collisions and acceleration and all those different kinds of things and how we examine motion in detail. Um, but gravitation is key to everything, so we're starting with gravitation. Now, you don't need to know these four fundamental forces in detail, but to give you guys some context and understanding here, this is a good image showing you the four forces. So we have the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. We have spoken about electromagnetic force last year and gravitation last year and this year. The strong and weak are inherent to a lot of chemistry and physics because these are really relevant to the, the atom and the nucleus. So the strong force holds the nucleus together, protons and neutrons. The weak force is where you have decay of radioactive elements and it's about neutrinos. A lot of the particles that you'll notice here are not appropriate for the 10th grade. You're not going to learn about them this year. You may learn about them in the DP physics if you choose that option, uh, but I'm not sure. And you definitely have learned about them in university if you took physics in university. But if we look here, what I always like to help you guys understand is that what we're learning is never, in science, is never the whole picture. There's always more to come, but we're learning it bit by bit, and then um, we'll build on it from there. So if we look at the relative strengths of forces, we set the strength of the strong force as one, that's the strongest force, so we set it as one, and the electromagnetic force is one 137th the strength of the strong force. But it works for infinite distance, and the range of the strong force is very, very small, the size of the nucleus, which makes sense because it's in the nucleus. The weak force is 10 to the negative 6, so it's much weaker than the electromagnetic and the strong force, 
um, with even, even smaller range than the strong force does. And gravitation is the weakest by far, six times the negative 59 in comparison to one for the strong force, and its range is also infinite. Um, but the big thing here is that we have the strength um, of the gravitational force is directly divided by the mass of the particles, whereas the kinetic force is just between charges, those can't get any more, more or less massive, but the mass of things like the sun is so huge, you can have a huge... Um, strength even if it's very far away. So make a note of this. Remember, don't rub particles. We're not doing that in this course, um, but I always like to help you guys understand there's more to this puzzle than we're learning in this class. So let's clarify weight versus mass. So we've all seen video clips of astronauts, either old clips from NASA or different space uh, stations around the world, and um, or movie clips, and you see the S kind of bouncing around in space on the moon or in the, in the space station, everyone kind of floating around. Why is that the case? Well, that is because the force of gravity is much greater or smaller, right? So gravity here on Earth is much greater than gravity on the moon. Does anybody know what the force of gravity on Earth is, the number we apply to it? And then with that in mind, that's how we measure weight, right? So weight is measured with a scale, also with a, new, a spring scale, because weight is a direct measure of the force of gravity acting on an object or a person. So your weight changes based on where you are in the world. So look at this person's weight. So they're 200 pounds or 90 kilograms on Earth and only 33.2 pounds or 15 kilos on the moon because that is directly proportional to the force of gravity. Whereas mass is the amount of matter inside of an object or individual. So that's going to be constant unless you are changing your mass and how you're losing weight, you're gaining weight, you're growing, that kind of stuff. But if you are keeping a constant body mass, then that's going to be the same no matter where you are in the world. So the mass of an astronaut on Earth versus an astronaut, an astronaut on the moon is exactly the same. Their weight, however, is drastically different. So we measure weight with a scale, like a bathroom scale, um, or a mass balance using class. Um, so we measure mass with, a, with kilograms or grams or pounds if you're not metric. And we use a spring scale to measure the, the weight because a spring scale measures force and weight is a measure of the force of gravity acting on an object. So what is the Newton? We talked about Newtons before as the unit of force, and we are doing this last year, but to clarify, this will also make more sense to you as unit progresses, this definition. But one Newton is the acceleration of one kilogram of mass over a distance of one meter in a second over a second. So its acceleration, remember, is change in, in speed per distance per time. So acceleration is one meter per second per second of one kilogram. Again, if you don't fully visualize that yet, don't worry about it. Write it down, put a little star beside it. We will get there throughout this unit. <coughs> so this difference here is because, of course, the mass um, is the amount of matter in a person or an object, but the weight is the force of gravity pulling on that object or a person. And the gravity changes on different things, like different planets, the moon, etc., in space, all those kinds of things. So, we can calculate the force acting on an object uh, by using the force, the, um, the formula F equals mg. This is your first formula, guys. So, write it down both in your notes and on the formula page. Um, F is the force due to gravity, m is mass in kilograms, and g is the acceleration due to gravity, which on Earth is a constant. If you change the location, you have to change the value of little g. Um, so make sure when you write your formulas down, you also write down what the letters represent. So F is force to gravity, mass is M is mass, and G is acceleration to gravity. Okay, and the units, kilograms for mass, and we have um, forces in newtons, and gravity is acceleration, so it's meters per second squared. So all that stuff is important when you're doing every single formula. Because I will give you a formula sheet, but I will not define what the terms are for you. You have to memorize how the formulas are, but you have to know how and when to use them. So on Earth, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. 
So put that down in your notebook as well. It's a concept you need to memorize. On the moon, it's only 1.6 meters per second squared. So if we look at the astronaut in each picture, so we have the mass and weight of the astronaut in both images here on the Earth and on the moon, same mass, 60 kilograms, because their amount of matter in that astronaut is the same, but their, their weight is quite different. So I want you to figure out what their, uh, the force is acting on these two astronauts. With our new formula here, F equals mg, with the mass is given in the formula, and our g value is given here. So pause it, do the two calculations, and we'll check your work in a second. Okay, so here's the first answer. F equals mg, 68 kilograms was the astronaut's mass on both the moon and Earth, because mass is how much it matters in the individual. And this is the gravitation on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared, so it's essential to gravity on Earth. So our force is 664.4 newtons, 666.4 newtons. And then on the moon, the force is still 68 kilograms because mass is constant, but my acceleration to gravity is quite different. So now I'm at 108.8 newtons of force. This is a force due to gravity, F equals mg. Okay, so check your work. Notice as well here how this is the standard level of work you need to show in calculations in physics. The formula, the substitution where you put in the numbers with the units, and then the answer with the units. Now because it's just simple formula, that's all the steps you need. In a bigger formula, you might need more steps, multiple calculations to do. Um, but for now, this is a good place to start. Okay, and as you always show me at least these three steps, formula, substitution with units, answer with units, you will get full points. If you make a mistake, I can send you partial points for having the right formula, for having the right substitution, if you make a small calculation error. So keep track of that. Okay, um, so today's, the lesson, the investigation we're we'll doing is looking at our gravitation in our lab. So here are those definitions I was talking about earlier of those key terms. Um, I put a screenshot of this on Schoology. You can also use it in the video, but make sure you clarify the difference between like energy is the capacity for doing work. That's how we describe it in physics. Um, time is scalar. It's not about physics in classical. Classical physics, we're not doing relativistic physics. We'll introduce what it is today. Um, not today, but in this unit, but we're not going to talk about it. It's way beyond the scope of 10th grade. Um, so make sure you're clear what these things are. Okay? Okay, big idea number one, write this in your notebook. How does gravity cause objects to fall and keep satellites in orbit? We're going to spend several lessons talking about gravitation in this context. Okay, so there's a video clip here about Galileo's inclined plane experiment. I'm not going to play the whole thing for you in the screencast. It's just a waste of upload time, um, but the link is put for you guys on, um, on uh, Schoology. You can watch it yourselves, or you can put it to the whole class on the projector from that link on Schoology. Okay. So your lab today is to recreate this experiment that was done by Galileo, where he tried to slow down gravity using the ramps. Um, so to really see what's happening with gravity, we can't let it happen in its normal 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. It's just changing too quickly for us to get accurate readings, especially with the technology that Galileo had available to him. He didn't have motion detectors and these kinds of detailed uh, light gates, or technology that allows us to capture motion um, much more accurately at a moment in time. So he doesn't have clocks. How could he measure without a clock the time? Well, if you saw in the video, he used the volume of water from a constant to water, how much was let out per unit time. So because we're looking at mass and gravity, those are the ones we're looking at, what should we control? What are variables, independent, independent variables? This is, as a whole class data collection, so take a minute to think about this. So the independent variable is going to be mass in kilograms. Independent variable is the volume of water in milliliters. So everyone in their group is going to measure the mass of the balls you're going to be using in kilograms. So if you measure in grams on a scale, convert it to kilograms. And the volume of water you're measuring in milliliters. 
So there is no separate sheet for this. What you need to do is as a class, you're going to at least four groups, and I want you to make one Google Sheet to share all your data in. You're going to do five trials. Five trials is, is the minimum for stats, but also for physics because there's so many sources of error, which is someone clicking the timer incorrectly and that kind of stuff. We want to have extra data to average in so that our mean is more representative of the actual pattern, the actual trend in the data. So two of those four groups will use tennis balls, floor hockey balls, and baseball to have a similar size, but different masses. So take the mass of all those three kinds of balls and use your data from that. And then the two other groups will use golf balls, squash balls, and ping pong balls. Again, similar sizes, but different masses. Okay, so what you're gonna do is go collect the data. Or you're gonna collect similar to how that with the, the volume of water produced at different amounts of time on your ramps. Your ramps are quite long, not as long as Galileo used, um, but make sure you're doing constants as a class. You have to have the same amount, the same incline will be important constant to have, the same distances you're letting it go from, um, the same amount of water you're opening the lever for on the burette to allow the same amount of water to come out, all those kinds of things. So keep in mind, talk as a class about what constants you have to do. Ms. Couture can help you with that as well. Um, have good constants, five trials. If you do a trial and you know it didn't work well, someone forgot to turn the water valve, someone didn't grab the ball once it go, just don't record that one, do another one. Okay, even with five trials that seem to go really well, it's very likely you're gonna have sources of error just from the um, reaction time of humans is not that great. Okay, so take some time to do that, collect your data and share it with me. We'll learn how to analyze it together next class or probably next week when I'm back. Take care, guys.